Free, a short story, written and narrated by Dyson. I wish I could say that I was born on the dry lands of the Gobi Desert, completely isolated from human life, and that the awkward myoclonic seizures that my body undergoes from time to time isn't a reaction to fear, but my rendition of a rain dance. I wish I could say that my 16 years on this earth isn't defined by the first nine, and that I, like most people who have some point found themselves lying uncomfortably on a psychiatrist's couch or standing flat foot in front of a mirror, staring precariously at themselves for so long that their bodies fade and their problems become their reflection, will not be defined by a family member that lives to raise me into submission, nor by my inherited bubble society that has mastered the art of gender intolerance. I wish I could say all of these things. Type all of these things so you can read all of these things and maybe believe all of these things. But I'm no good at lying, even on paper. So here's my truth. It seems to me that everyone nowadays has to be a trending headline, a hot topic, a hashtag, or they fear that what they say or do won't be remembered. Never mind it ever being significant or what truly makes them happy. It is this that I tell my new head doctor, Henry T. Thimbu. The bald and busy 47-year-old South African shrink that proudly earned his American citizenship the same year as his psychiatric degree from Columbia University. Both accomplishments came years before he arrogantly replaced my previous shrink, Dr. Evan Miles from John Hopkins, who replaced Madison Cantor from Harvard, who replaced the quirky guy from a free legal union hiring pit. Now that guy I liked. He was ghostly white with weird curly red hair and during our first and only meeting, he wore a wrinkled white shirt, beige slacks and sandals. Sandals? It was he who took one look at me when I was nine years old and knew he was in over his head. He hadn't an Ivy League education, but was the most insightful of the four therapists in my opinion, since he realized right away that our sessions would go nowhere. Now here is Harry. Determined to waste my time trying to get me to talk about my early life and dig up any experiences that could be the cause of why my body briefly undergoes these awkward jerks. Especially since every x-ray and CAT scan at every hospital I've been admitted into over the past seven years has seemingly proven that I'm perfectly fine. Most days, if I don't look into the mirror too long, I can believe it. That I'm fine. If I don't allow myself to think too long about nothing and let the void fill itself with my trauma, I can believe that my first nine years didn't ruin me. And now I'm not just some plastic version of what I could have become if I hadn't grown up in the environment that I had or the mother that God had given me. She's magical. My mother. That's what the head doctors all confirmed with their eyes before and after my quarter appointment therapy sessions. Those brilliant professionals who had built, in some cases, more than 20 years of education and experience on how to detect fact from fiction and a stellar performance from a real-life revelation would get all spun around and confused whenever my mother entered their personal space. This would happen each time my mother dropped me off to one of their offices and would pick me up always wearing a colorful and fitting dress that slightly highlighted her curves and always wearing that blinding smile of hers. I watch all of those doctors forget every word I ever said in their offices. I'll be ready to dismiss anything I will tell them later in exchange for just a little private time with her. I'd laugh inside myself, knowing how foolish that would be. But I understood. Those men and one woman had gotten caught up in my mother's aura and lost all sense of reality. They had taken a glance at my mother's flawless skin, an acorn tint reddish brown from head to heel, They didn't even seem to bother the racist people we encountered that somehow were drawn to help her help me. I'd stand back in awe, watching them and others marvel over my mother's limbs, thick and strong, and the sturdiness of her mind, unknowing that she worked excessively throughout the days to come off to strangers as delicate, harmless, and completely sane. 
my mother's hair, that soft tangle of vines woven around her shoulders, locked beautifully, straight only at the roots and thick from start to end, had the curliest tips that spread themselves in the wind and enticed random strangers to touch. My mother would politely laser stretching hands off with her eyes. All the while, all I could think of since I was nine years old was that my mother was growing her hair long and wild so that one day, if I didn't submit to her wishes, the ends of her locks would come alive like the tentacles of an octopus and squeeze with all of her strength and energy, making certain that her fingerprints would be clean of murder. For that woman is free and was determined to remain free by any means. When it came to freedom, there was nothing my mother wouldn't sacrifice, including me. At least that's what she told me on my 10th birthday. And all the while smiling that same beam of sunshine that she'd flash on the head doctors. She knew that such a bright smile would send them walking away, scratching their heads, assuming God had gifted her with such majesty to chase away the darkness in my life. Nonetheless, I was their patient, who weakly made a black hole out of their leather couches. On my 10th birthday, my mother called herself my hero, and me hers, like she had taken three months to reflect on things. She said hero as if it was something to be celebrated, like she and I were supposed to rip up the bed sheets from our borrowed government cots and painfully pin them through the skin of our backs for the chance to fly off and spread those lies to anyone gullible enough to believe such craziness. At the time, my mother and I were living in our ninth shelter in as many months and in as many states, and yet her voice floated the word hero over a crusty vanilla cake bearing a single candle meant to represent the first year we were on our own. Make your wish, Orissa, my mother whispered sweetly. I remembered how her face was illuminated by the candle's light that sliced a hole out of the dark, and how there must have been four dozen strangers surrounding us, standing in the shadows and likely wondering why the organizers of the woman's shelter hadn't delivered a store-bought cake to commemorate one of their birthdays. Yet there we were, me once again submitting to my mother's order and taking in a deep breath to blow out the light while making a wish. <laughs> 